My sermon passage is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 to 42. Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from, drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But none said, what do you wish, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples besought him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him food? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not you say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes and see how the fields are already white for harvest. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of your words that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> what a story. It's familiar. 
Why, it's the woman at the well. But it may also be obscure. Because when lots of people think of it, mostly men people, they can't get past this woman, that nasty woman and her supposed sins. Go call your husband, Jesus says. I have no husband, the woman says. That's right, Jesus says, because you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. <laughs> Sir, I see that you're a prophet, the woman says, and gotcha. Gotcha, say a lot of holier-than-thou interpreters, mostly men who think they're holier than she, and they're so missing the point. John's point in this story is that Jesus knows everything. It's not gotcha. It's get him. Get him, hearer of the gospel. Reader of this gospel we call John. You better get it. You better get him and you better get this. This. Jesus. Is Jesus, capital T, the, capital C, Christ. The word with God. The word who was God who was in the beginning with God, as it says in the very first two verses of this gospel. Jesus knows everything, according to the gospel of John. This is Jesus of stardust, not Jesus of the dust of Galilee. But according to generations of interpreters, this woman should be on her face before him, not because of who he is, but because of what she is, a nasty woman, a girl gone bad. Men of the church assumed that she was a harlot. Thank God that God is still speaking, which after all is a way of saying that we're still listening and thinking and reading and praying and watching and changing our minds and our interpretations. Meanwhile, those who still see a, quote, fallen woman at the well, they're straining at a net. Or to borrow another scriptural illusion, they're imagining a speck in her eye while missing the beam of lumber in their own. No woman at the well is no special sinner. The story says nothing whatsoever about her morality or why she's had five husbands. It says not a thing. She could be trapped in a family marriage custom and the last man in the family line has refused to do his duty and marry her. Whatever. It doesn't say. And Jesus could not care less. The story does say this woman at this well has a living faith and a living God her faith grows as she talks with Jesus, and most importantly for the story, she's a witness. She is a witness to a God who is still speaking, and she is a witness to God in Christ. Glory, hallelujah. I could end it right here. We could pass the plates, sing the closing hymn, go out and eat and go to the house. I not feel good about it because she's been redeemed now, and she glories in his name, as the hymn says. And I think that redeeming the reputation of the woman at the well is that important. She was slandered for too long and still is in some pulpits. And we should think about that and what difference it makes and why it's important to redeem her. So let's not go just yet. There's more. Picking out that one fine point of this rich, rich story to concentrate on would do it injustice. But so would trying to preach all of the 42 verses. So I'm going to try to paint the big picture. And it's a big, beautiful picture. And I'm going to try to hit some high points. Jesus is busting out all over this story. He's ignoring borders. And he's crossing lines that people just didn't cross. He's busting out of the confines of his own place. He's moving out of his own holy space, his own comfort zone. Or maybe it's better to say he's taking it with him. He's opening up his religion and living way past everyone's expectations. It'll help you see this if you put on your Bible thinking caps. Go ahead. Put on your Bible thinking caps. Now imagine a map. There could be a map in the back of the Bible. I meant to check. I can't remember if there's maps in the back of the pew Bibles. But imagine a map. Here it is. Oklahoma City. Now, pan out in your mind to see the whole state. Now, Oklahoma City is right here. and It's the Jerusalem metro area. And around it is Judea. That's where Jesus is at the start of this story. He's in Jerusalem, in Judea. Now, think of Enid. It's about 100 miles north of here. 
That's Galilee. That area is Galilee. And a little bitty carrier, population 85, where my first church was a few years ago, that's a ways out from Enid, that's Nazareth. And up the road a bit from there, about 12 miles, is another town called Gultry, and that can be Capernaum. Now get this in your mind. Jerusalem and Judea to the south, and Galilee, the area with Nazareth and Capernaum, these little towns that we hear of up here in the north. And remember that Galilee is a region, and it's Jesus' old stomping grounds. Galilee is where Jesus is from. It's out in the country. It's agricultural, like Enid is. And Jesus talks with a Galilean accent. His language and figures of speech are rural. Pay attention to the parables. It's always about farming this and harvesting that, planting this. Now think of Guthrie in Logan County between here and Enid. Logan County is Samaria. All right? So in this story, Jesus is on his way from Jerusalem back to Galilee, and he's going through Samaria, or from Oklahoma City back to Enid by way of Guthrie. And the distances are very close. Now, if I haven't already given you a headache, imagine this. <laughs> Guthrie, bear with me. Guthrie is a Muslim town in the area around it. Logan County is a Muslim community. And let's say that the woman at the well is a Muslim. But she's an American citizen. But she's suspected of sending money to terrorists, to ISIS. She's suspected of that. In other words, this woman, to you and to me and to all of us or most of us around here, is an enemy. And she's doubly despised because she's a Muslim and she's a traitor. Now, the woman at the well obviously was not a Muslim, obviously not an American. But that, meant, that might help you see what's going on in this story. Jesus was going way outside his own upbringing. Jews and Samaritans were enemies who worshipped the same God. Both were descendants of Abraham. And both were descendants of tribes of Israel. But they differed over how and where to worship God, among other things. Jesus, rather Jews, worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem. And Samaritans worshipped to the north at Mount Gerizim, and they really couldn't stand one another, the Jews and the Samaritans. Yet, Jesus persisted in speaking to her, even asking her for a drink of water, despite social customs and habits and deep-seated cultural and religious animosity and suspicion. That's the bigger picture that John, the Gospel of John, is painting here. Jesus has come to save the world, and he's getting started in this Gospel right here with this suspicious woman at this well. That's where it starts in John. How audacious. First, a Jewish man didn't start a conversation with any unknown woman. And second, a Jewish teacher like Jesus did not talk to an unknown woman in public. In a water well, especially one called Jacob's well, that was as public as a Brahms. <laughs> which there's plenty of between here and here. And so Jesus, very publicly, in front of God and everybody, blew away boundaries of gender. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Galatians 3.28, right? There's no longer male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. But Jesus also blew away or blew past boundaries of religion, culture, history, geography, and suspicion and hate. And the woman became a witness after Jesus looked her in the eye and shed light on her life. And many Samaritans, it says, believed in him, came to trust him and became loyal to him because of the woman's testimony. And then Jesus went and stayed with them, teaching for a couple of days, and more believed because of his own words. They believed that they'd met the Savior of the world thanks to that woman, that Samaritan woman, at that well. It's so important to know that she's been redeemed in biblical interpretation and to understand everything going on in this story, especially as we struggle to this day with gender and what it means and doesn't mean to be a man or a woman. Redeeming her takes men down a notch and it elevates women in a way that patriarchy in the church could not abide for way too long. Gail O'Day a professor at the Candler School of Theology in Georgia put it like this. The Samaritan woman's successful 
evangel evangelization of her town belies the myth of the privileged position of men as witnesses and disciples. Because of her witness, the number of persons who believe in Jesus grows. Jesus treats her as a serious conversation partner, the first person in the gospel to whom he makes a bold statement of self-revelation. Jesus reveals his holy self to her. But it's easy to miss. She said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. That's the Revised Standard Version. The New Revised Standard Version catches a critical nuance in what Jesus is saying here, here and in other places in the Gospel of John. I am, Jesus said, the one who is speaking to you. I am, Jesus says again and again in the Gospel of John, revealing in John, revealing his divinity, revealing his closeness and oneness to God, his Father. I am, he says, just as God said to Moses in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And Jesus first said it in John to this woman, I am. It's no wonder Jesus, Jesus blew up all those other boundaries, blew past them and ignored them. And if we will follow him, we can at least infiltrate them. Ethnicity, culture, religion, all these boundaries for Christ's sake and for the sake of the world that God so loves. So much of ethnicity and culture and religion has to do with pride and it can be a good thing. There can be a good kind of pride. But some ways of emphasizing our differences can be rooted in a bad thing if it breeds animosity instead of community, if it has to do with fear. And you know the kind of thing I'm talking about. We here are civilized. We're cool. And they over there in that country or that neighborhood or that church or that bar, they're not. They wear those clothes and they eat that food. And they listen to that music and they live that way. Everybody has their own we's and their own they's. And they's are less than. They're less than we are, anyway. Why, they're Samaritans. They're Muslims. They're Mexicans. They're East Side. They're Nichols Hills. And they're kind of scary to us. And we're kind of scary to them. There are at least two or three different kinds of we's and they's right here. And none of us is scared. Thanks be to God. We are bucking the latest national trend, even as we walk in step with the freshest movement of the Spirit. When different kinds of people avoid one another and won't talk to one another and don't try to hear and understand one another, whether it's blacks and whites or Americans, and Mexicans or Protestants and Catholics or Christians and Muslims or conservatives and liberals, straights and gays, when few people are even trying, then just two people can spark a scandal in the movement. Just like one Jewish man and one Samaritan woman. Jesus and this woman sparked a scandal that has had people talking for 2,000 years. Some folks gossiping about her and some people still in denial about him. What everybody ought to be doing is listening to them and paying attention to what they're doing. They're sharing a drink of water and they're having a conversation. Jesus, our teacher and Lord, by his words and his actions, he's teaching again. He says, I don't play those games. Not those racist games down the street, not those class games across town, not those gender games or sexual orientation games across generations. Not political games across party lines nor religious games across denominational lines or lines of Jewish, Christian, or Muslim descent from Father Abraham. We all have the same father in Abraham. And not those international trade games, the ones that are proxies for geopolitical power plays. Show me a line and I'll cross it, Jesus says. And we can't play those games either, not if we're being jesus -y. We have to cross lines even if it's scary. But you know what? We have it on good authority. 
perfect love casts out fear. And that's not some flawless ideal. Perfect love is devoted, loyal, trusting love. That's what casts out fear. It's not perfection. It's dedication. And that's living water. That's love that rejuvenates. And that living water is the good stuff. Even though, like a lot of medicine, it can be hard to swallow. It's not bitter, but it's hard water. We have to choke it down if we want to get healing from the mesmerizing futile games of we and they and us and them. Turns out chapter 4 of John is about a lot more than Jesus meeting a woman at a well. It's a call to the church to come in off the world's hopeless playing fields. It's a call to people of faith to tear down walls and borders, not to erect them. Jesus shows us the way in this story. To follow him means we have to tear down or climb over or dig under or ignore or sneak through any difference that keeps us from loving God and loving one another. Sneaking is no sin, you know. <laughs> Think of the Underground Railroad. Think of the sanctuary movement 30 years ago and as it's trying to blossom again. Are we ready to sneak if we're called to? Now, I know y'all should be sitting up here because I know I'm preaching to the choir. But sometimes even the choir needs to be reminded where its songs come from. Let us pray. Oh God, we are called to overcome in the name of Jesus and justice any difference that keeps us from loving neighbors and strangers and you. The hour is coming and is now here. You have given us living water. It's your love entrusted to us, rejuvenating us, saving us, reviving us. How ungrateful it would be for us to try to water that down. Amen. Amen.